Yellowstone's geographical mysteries solved by 4D models. This is by Professor of Oceanography, University of Rhode Island, Christopher Kincaid, on the conversation. 4D model shows and solves Yellowstone's geographical mysteries. A decade ago, with Ross Griffiths of the Australian National University, we aimed to build a 4D model which could re replicate the Earth's tectonic processes. Now our research has helped us understand how some of America's most mysterious geographical formations took shape. We wanted to build a new lab apparatus for simulating subduction zones. These are regions of the Earth where cold, dense oceanic plates meet less dense continental plates and descend into the Earth's mantle. The mantle is the vicious layer between the Earth's crust and outer core. Subduction is a dominant force driving movement of such plates and one of the features that makes Earth unique in the solar system. Our goal was to represent pressures and movements in the mantle as it responded to the sinking oceanic plates as well as to thermal evolution, which is movement of heat from the core to the surface. Many areas of science and engineering have a long tradition of employing analog rather than computerized models to represent larger scale processes. Just as toys like planes, boats, and dolls can be modeled to represent larger versions using scale factors, laboratory experiments may be used to model the mantle system by employing certain dynamic scale factors. To our 3D analog model, we added a fourth dimension, that is time. We used a fiberglass plate to represent the Earth's subduction oceanic plate, subducting oceanic plate and high velocity viscosity corn syrup to represent the Earth's mantle. Three features make corn syrup a nice analog for the mantle. Like the mantle, the fluid is inertia free. This means that when forces are removed, the flop stops immediately. Corn syrup has a temperature-dependent viscosity, so heat makes it runny, while cold makes it strong and unyielding. It also scales well to the mantle and can provide a nice dessert after the work is complete. We first used our apparatus to study a number of general aspects and mechanisms of subduction zones without focusing on any particular region. But all that changed when we joined a diverse group of geoscientists interested in determining the cause of some strange magma activity in the Pacific Northwest over the last 20 million years. The focus then became an odd volcanic track in central and eastern Oregon in the United States called the High Lava Plains. The goal was to connect the dots between the High Lava Plains and two other notable geographical features the Columbia River flood basalts and Snake River Plain. This area around the Yellowstone Park is the epicenter of much debate in the earth sciences. A number of scientists have said that the Columbia River flood basalts and the Snake River Plain are the expressions of a surfacing mantle plume. The mantle plume is made of hotter, less dense rock, buoyed upward through the mantle towards the earth's surface. They resemble the kinds of plumes that we see every day, hot air balloons, lava lamps, pasta sauce on a stove, and steam plumes from industrial towers are all common examples where less dense fluid or air rises through denser material. In the mantle, plumes take on a classic shape. A large bulbous leading volume called the plume head followed by a thin tail called the plume conduit. The surfacing of plume heads has been linked with huge outpourings of basalt called large igneous provinces, while tails are commonly proposed as the cause of linear volcanic tracks like the Hawaiian island chain in the Pacific. But for our area, a plume was not the most obvious suspect. One issue is that the Columbia River flood bed basalts and the Snake River Plain are not laid out in a linear pattern, as would be expected if a plume surfaced between and beneath the westward drifting North American continental plate. Instead, the two features seem broken, with the Snake River Plain track displaced well south of the flood basalts. Nor does the high lava plains 
volcanic track fit the classic plume model? It is odd for two reasons. It appears west of the flood basalts and its magma output grows younger towards the west. We would intuitively expect the opposite. As the plate moves west, the head of the plume should arrive at the surface first, causing the flood basalts, while the tail should cause a track of volcanic activity that grows younger towards the east, just like the Snake River Plain. To accurately represent this complex subduction system, we need to include a number of features. One of these was a phenomenon called rollback subduction, which is when the sinking oceanic plate rolls back underneath itself as it descends into the mantle. We also had to represent the extension of the overriding plate. The overriding plate is made up of buoyant continental crust and heavy chilled mantle. The dense oceanic plate, which has only uh, a sliver of crust, sinks beneath the overriding plate. Between the sinking and overriding plate lies what is referred to as the mantle wedge, the source region for volcanic arcs that roughly parallel the trench in most subduction zones. The project's piece de resistance was a representation of the mantle plume where we could control the plume's buoyancy and position. We did this by using a modified pressure cooker where corn syrup is heated and then injected through a heated heating pipe into the base of the tank. By controlling its temperature, we control the density, viscosity, and rise rate of the plume. Most prior models inject plumes into a simplified fluid environment. Models which incorporate both subduction and a plume show this simple view is not sufficient. Rollback motion produces vigorous flow from the back to the front of the subduction plate. This is known as a toroidal flow. Toroidal flow. This is like a super large eddy in the mantle. Our results showed that toroidal flow had a big impact on the buoyancy plume feature. In the initial stages, we released the plume into a tank of still fluid where it evolved in textbook fashion. A large leading head formed, which rose to the surface, stalled, and spread out. Behind this was a narrow conduit through which plume fluid was continually fed from the base to the surface of the tank. But as soon as we turned the plates on, it was apparent this simple morphology was no longer in play. Circulation currents driven by the plates immediately deformed both head and tail, dramatically limiting the ability of continued upward buoyant motion. As the toroidal flow moved around the edge of the sinking plate, it effectively took a bite out of the plume head, drawing the material into thin lens and dragging it towards the edge of the subduction plate. The remains of the plume surfaced in a pattern that matches the location and timing of the high lava plains. The unchewed part of the plume head rose and surfaced as a big pulse of heated, melting substance similar to the flood basalts. The plume tail tilted over beneath the westward drifting overriding plate, leaving patterns of heating and melting that grew younger to the east, just like the Snake River Plains. The toroidal flow not only bit the head in half, it also pushed the tail well to the south, matching the real feature. This is how corn syrup helped us explain how a single plume could be responsible for the Columbia River flood basalts the southerly deflection of the Snake River Plains and the bizarre westward younging high lava plains track. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. 
Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, in Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.